Behind the Badge Illinois, giving you the inside scoop on public safety and those who protect and serve. Hear real stories directly from law enforcement experts and get a chance to ask questions about issues you've always wanted to know more about. You have the right to remain informed. This is Behind the Badge Illinois. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Behind the Badge, Illinois, another exciting segment sponsored by Team Hochberg. If you're looking to purchase a new home or refinance your existing home, give me a call, 855-56-DAVID. Go to 56david.com. We uh, do issue closing cost credits, as Lou will attest. His daughter is uh, in the process of buying a home to you and your family members and your staff. Um, so if you got anybody looking to refinance or purchase a home, Love to have the opportunity to have that discussion with them. Uh, the, today's topic is going to be, so you want to become a police officer. We've got returning experts uh, down Southern Illinois, Chief Bruggeman up in DeKalb, Chief Bird, and out in the uh, North Shore, Chief Jogman. So let's start it, guys. I'll, I'll just throw it out there. I want to be a police officer. I'll, I'll just put no. it out there. No, the answer is no. The answer is no. <laughs> right right, no. Done. Done. I, I wouldn't pass the Rorschach test. Is that yeah. it? Okay. And yeah. then the yeah. physical test or any test possibly. Um, so if, if 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 a high school senior, okay, we're 60 days away from graduation, are there any type of educational or age requirements to become a police officer? And let's start, let's go south to north. So Chief Bruggeman. Do do you have any any type of uh, age requirements to become a police officer on your force? We do, and it's kind of important to note that majority of the state uh, and majority of police departments are covered by what's called the Board of Fire and Police Commissioners. Um, a lot of people act uh, they're elect their appointed positions within your city local government, and um, there's an act in the Illinois statute that kind of draws about uh, kind of just lays the groundwork for what it takes to be a police officer and how to get hired. So uh, the majority of departments in the state are usually gonna use that Board of Fire and Police Commissioners and those same rules. So for us, the rules are you have to be 21. So you gotta be 21 uh, up to the age of 35 with um, some leeway for active duty military. So we can do active duty military for every year of active duty military, you can extend that 35 to 45. Um, that is, this is for new people. This is people that have never been a police officer in their entire life, okay? Um, so you got to have no criminal convictions for some, you know, no felony convictions. And there's a lot of other things like that. But realistically, for us, if you want to be a police officer, you got to be 21. You've got to have some type of, and, and this is probably with the majority of of bigger departments, some type of education, so or military experience. So what we do is we'll take two years of college, so up to sixty-four hours of college or an associate's degree, and, or the equivalent of two years of military experience. So you know that's you're coming out of high school. You can go into the military for a couple of years. You can go to college for a couple of years. But once you're twenty-one, you can start applying. Or actually, once you're twenty, you can start applying to be a police officer. With Does that office. include? Um community college or does it have to be uh, a, a, a big university most people are going to include anything any type of any type of secondary education okay so yeah um you know some departments require you to have a bachelor's degree or an associate's degree um and but i'd say the majority of departments just require you to have some type of college now there are many departments smaller smaller departments that just require you to have a high school diploma um so that is still there so it just depends from city to city what those requirements might be, um, you know, and, and what kind of pool of applicants they want to they want to pull from. All right, Chief Bird, I'll throw it up to you. You got a college right in your backyard there, my alma mater, Northern Illinois University. And when I graduated back in 1988, there we had job job uh, a whole job job fair. job fair, and you would put your application in, and they would post sure. jobs, and companies would come out of Chicago with three or four recruiters. Is that going on and like interview a hundred kids in, in a day and head back home? Is that happening with your force still at Northern Illinois? Yeah. So we, you know, we have a pretty good uh, recruitment team going between uh, human resources, which is at city hall for us. And then of course, uh, members of the uh, DeKalb police department. So we don't just walk across the street, which we, which we do. 
Uh, but we also go to different universities throughout the state of Illinois, um, actually even into Wisconsin. So and Indiana. So any border states, we would uh, we would definitely uh, reach out to them and and go to those university job fairs, uh, Dave, just like you spoke of. And, and those have been pretty productive for us. Um, so you're right. That's 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 a big uh, I mean, that's where you get your biggest bang for your buck. If you really want to look at it that way, you throw a table up in the middle of the, uh, uh, you know, of one of the, the, the big, um, not, not a dorm, but you know what they have there, uh, where the, the common areas, yeah, in, the common areas in the university. So, um, and you try to make those contacts. So, um, here at DeKalb, we reduce our requirement, uh, that you, that you could apply if you had a high school diploma. Um, and the reason why I pushed this, um, it was very important to me personally, because, I wanted to give some people some opportunities because everyone, I think we all know how expensive college is. And there are a lot of people who cannot attend college for whatever reason. A lot of different reasons out there who people have their own reason why they can't do it. Um, and I wanted to give some people some opportunities to at least uh, apply. And if they come up to the standards, then why shouldn't you get that opportunity? And I know one thing I have learned is that some people who who cannot afford college, who who work a job and they grind it out every day somewhere. I mean, I don't know. It, it could be a mechanic, let's say. And he's grinding it out, at, you know, wherever he works at every day. He has an amazing work ethic. He's on time for work every day. He works hard, but he just can't afford going to college. So why wouldn't we give this guy an opportunity when he has some of the attributes that we're really looking for, you know? So so we, we've done that. Um, and the, and the best thing about it for me, Dave, is that they have to come up to our standards. Some people say, well, you're lowering the standards. No, we're not. We're letting somebody get in the door. They still have to come up to our standards. I mean, they still have to meet them. And at the end of the day, at least we're giving them an opportunity. That's all we're doing. So previous think, job, so, so previous job experience. It's like yes. you said, it could be a mechanic wrenching for two years, three years. Sure. This isn't for me. Yep. And I want, you know, I, you know, fixing cars. I always want to be in law enforcement. You and DeKalb view that as real life experience. Hit the 21. Let's sure. talk. Oh, let's okay. talk. Let's give him a shot. I mean, why not? I mean, like I said, I mean, work ethic is everything in this job. Being on time, working hard. Those are the things that we look for. Integrity. <laughs> I mean, it's huge. I mean, like, so there's no guarantee that someone who comes out of a four year institution is going to have all these attributes. It doesn't work that way. I, some people believe it to be like this rock hard. Oh, they went to college. Yeah, okay. I know a lot of people went to college and they party hard, man. And that's about it. <laughs> so, so I, I get, you know, so I, uh, yeah, not you chief. I'm talking about some people that I definitely could put my finger on and say, Hey, yeah, that it was playtime in college for some people. So, uh, so at the end of the day, I just felt like we were missing a big percentage of the community by isolating them in that way, I, you know, and I just know how expensive college is. I paid for three to go and I'm telling you, it's cost. So was that good. like, was that that way before you got to DeKalb or when you I got to DeKalb, you changed it up? I, I I fought for this. This is this is a change that I requested uh, in, in, uh, through the police fire commission as uh, Chief Boogerman talked about earlier. We had that installed here as well. And we went at it a couple of times, you know, the first time. Now, let me explain to you just real, real quick. And I understand it. I had uh, at the time, one of the members of the uh, on the commission was a, a very amazing lady. It's super intelligent. But she she came up through, you know, uh, she was a college professor. I mean, I mean, she, she couldn't even fathom this. Right. Because everyone she talks to probably has a master's or a Ph.D., you know, I mean, and, and nothing wrong with that, but she had never understood that, you know, beyond that, like there are people who who still have the same work ethic that you think are that it's important, but they might not have a college degree. So I was like, we have to give them at least an opportunity to come in the door because there are diamonds in the rough out there, I'm telling you, and you could and they're, and they're waiting for an opportunity. And we've seen guys come through ever since then who said, Chief, you know, I never would have got an opportunity because I had no way I could afford college. And we gave them a shot. And they're some of our hardest workers here. 
I mean, they, you know, they truly are. Now, if you want to, you know, if you want to go up the ranks and be promoted to sergeant, yeah, I'm going to ask you to go get a degree. Okay. You, know, you want to test for sergeant. But to get you in this door, and if you want to spend the rest of your life being a hardworking police officer for 25 years and retire with a pension, I'm going to give you a shot. All right. So that's why uh, we did that. How about you up there, Lou? So, Lou, Dave and Kirk mentioned something about Chief, I'm sorry, Chief Bergman and Chief Bird mentioned the fire and police um the commission. Are those are those local or is that via a state, Lou? So I think they both chiefs spoke um about a couple of different things that are in play here. So, you know, so there are state statutes that govern how people can become police officers. They want to have some consistency. And then there are boards of police and fire uh, commissions that are also governed, generally speaking, by statute, but are local, right? And so each department has generally, or each community has a board of volunteers that will assist in the selection and hiring of law enforcement officers and firefighters. And that's where there could be a little difference from town to town on whether or not um, some of the requirements, um, you know, whether it's a two-year degree, a four-year degree, or high school diploma. There are some differences there. So if people, young men and women, are thinking about becoming a police officer, there is no one path for sure. Um, you know, we, as, as Chief Bird states, we want to open the door to a variety of candidates because we want a mosaic. We want to represent our state you know, in our police ranks, we want to kind of be representative of the folks that we're policing and the people that are out there. So, you know, I've got a guy who was an iron worker for 10 years and decided this might be something for him. And he's one of the best detectives I've ever seen. It was just something that he, he was drawn to. So we definitely want to have um, a pool of applicants that, and that become police officers that, like I said, can be a representative of our community. So every community is a little bit different in that regard, but there are some pretty uh, there are some standards that everybody has to go through. So for those young people thinking being police officers, they don't necessarily have to go to college. They don't necessarily have to get a degree in criminal justice. They can. Um, we've hired people with degrees in finance. We've hired, you know, uh, physical education degrees. So just different degrees for people who've come on board and decided that for them, this is kind of a calling. Um, so they've got to, I guess, decide what they're interested to do in doing in their 19, 18, 19, 20 uh, but then there's a process that kind of starts when you're 20-ish. You start now looking at departments that maybe you're interested in. And so just to give a little kind of uh, understanding of how it works, each police department, state police, uh, county uh, sheriffs, we maintain lists of candidates. And so we establish these lists of candidates by, there's a process which we'll all talk about a little bit as we go on, but essentially we work off of these lists of candidates when we want to hire somebody. And generally speaking, traditionally, those lists would be good for two years. So you would go and test for, uh, you know, go through a process of testing for maybe four or five, six, 10 police departments separately, maybe make some of their lists and then be on that list. And then when a vacancy occurred at that department, they would then go through that list and call the people next online. And then a whole other process starts, which we'll get to. Um, but that's kind of how you get your foot into the door in uh, at, a, at a police department. So in your when you're turning, you know, in your 20s, you should start early 20, 20 years old. You should start looking at the departments, do some research, go online. Where would be a good fit for me? It's all about fit. We want officers that will, you know, some departments are heavy, heavy into community policing. Some departments are doing different types of policing because they have different types of crimes going on. You really want to be a good fit for that organization. So do your research. And then ultimately you'll start taking or going through processes, which start with, um, you have to apply. There's an application process. So each department, you can look online. There are certain um, websites that will tell you who's hiring it with different times, the processes, and you pick the towns you're interested in. You follow their rules. You know, I have to have an application in by this date. I have to do this A, B, and C. Um, and then there might be a written test. Generally speaking, there is generally a written exam for each municipality. Um, there's a power test that you have to take, a physical agility test that you have to get a uh, called a power card, a police officer wellness evaluation report. Uh, generally speaking, you have to take that. There's a, a physical test you have to take before you get into the police academy. So most towns have you do it once for them to make sure you can do it. And we can talk about what that consists of here in a minute. Um, but that's kind of the early process. You know, again, you look for the department you want to get hired at. If you meet their criteria, some may have college, some may have two years, some may be high school diploma. You apply and you go through their process. And then, like I said, the power card, which we could talk about, you want to get that as well. 
I got a quick question for for uh, Dave, and I'll go around the horn. Uh, so, Chief Bird, do you require your officers to live in DeKalb? I mean, is that a requirement like CPD? Residency, yeah. Right. So, uh, so the residency requirement, yeah. We uh, we do not. So they have a uh, they have a radius uh, that's been negotiated. Uh, it's, it's a, you know through our a labor structure with FOP. So we that's a negotiated. Uh, uh, like I said, residency that we have in place now. So we, um, and it's, it's pretty good for them. Um, so they, I mean, like I said, but they're not required to live in, within the city limits of uh, city of DeKalb. Uh, hi, you know, the chief, yes, I have to live within the city of DeKalb, uh, the city limits. But uh, as far as the rank and file, no, they do not. Uh, I have commanders also who live outside of the uh, framework of the city of DeKalb. So at the end of the day, the chief is the only one that is required, at least here in the city of DeKalb, to live within the city limits. All right, Lou, I mean, you got high rent district up there in Highland Park. Uh, I know that you live there. I did your loan, and I actually did Mindy's loan. You were just on the loan. But um, if uh, what type of requirements other than you being the chief having to live in, in a Highland Park? Um, I, I think the, those days are kind of uh, behind us. I don't think the vast majority of communities throughout the state of Illinois have a residency requirement. Uh, certainly Chicago does. Chicago, yeah. And I can think of a handful of other ones. Some towns have a, a, a take home car a program where the cars go home with the officers. And so in those towns, they clearly like to keep the squad cars in town. So there's a handful of towns that do that. But I would say the vast, vast majority of communities um, don't have that requirement anymore. And it's a double-edged sword. Um, I know our officers like to be able to go to the grocery store, maybe not run into somebody that they just swore out of domestic with, or maybe they arrested uh, last week and they're out there with their family. I mean, that is a challenge, right? When you do live in the community, you're going to run into those people who you've arrested or worse, you know? And, and so that can be quite awkward. But I can tell you, in, in having lived in the communities I've served, uh, both of them, um, you know, there is a lot of gratification to being part of the community. There just is, you know, you do get to walk amongst the folks that you're serving and hear from them and just connect differently. So it's, it's definitely a double-edged sword, but not really one of the requirements uh, for most municipalities uh, at this point. I think for state police, Dave, get me wrong. Yep. Uh, state police have to live in Illinois to be state police. Oh yeah, they cannot live up without the I state. Thought so. yeah. I, thought, I thought so. I thought yeah, so. they can't jump over to Indiana and get those no. awesome taxes. Uh, but uh, like Lou said, uh, I, you know, it's a double-edged sword, sword. So because, you know, you're going to have community that's going to be pushing for you. Like, hey, look, if you really have a vested interest, you should live here, you know, and you want to, you want to serve us, but you, you, you know, you know, you don't want to live within the community that you work in. So, you, you know, you'll get that push uh, from a lot of people. So, um, but in, in our eyes, uh, we felt like, you know, we would be, basically reducing, you know, the opportunities to have the best officer that we would want uh, in our uniform by, you know, by actually, you know, putting that residency requirement in place. So we extended it, Dave. So, you know, it, believe me, I think it's about uh, maybe about 30 miles um, right now. So, and it, like I said, this was negotiated with the FOP. So, uh, and most of these are negotiated type situations, but like Lou said, Chicago police for sure. But Chicago is a huge city. I mean, when I, you know, you can live on the south side of Chicago and work on the west side of Chicago, and you might not ever cross paths with somebody you arrested. It just depends, you know. So, uh, so a little bit different when you talk about a big city. But when you get into the small cities, I mean, I went to the movies one time. Quick story, and I got my girlfriend with me. I'm going walking down the aisle with popcorn, Dave, and some guy in the back yells out my name. I didn't know who he was. He said, hey, Trooper Bird. I'm like, I look back. And he said, hey, I got off that gun case. I'm like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> you know, and then I was like, okay, now I got to go to movies a little further than what I thought. <laughs> I was like, so, so it happens. Like Lou said, that's that's the kind of stuff that happens. It's uncomfortable, though, in, in some ways, uh, because, you know, now they're getting eyeballs, you know, especially if it's a bad guy. Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, this is this guy arrested on a, a aggravated UUW charge. He was uh, he was a convicted felon. I mean, it was the type of guy that you probably wouldn't want knowing who your girlfriend is. You know what yeah. I mean? So so or your kids. You know, imagine that. You know, um, so there, there's some there's definitely some issues with that. 
And you should, in some offices, I'm worried about that. And I understand because I went through it. So I get it. How about Down O'Fallon, Chief? Uh, you know, it brings what? up a good, a good, it's a little bit off topic, but like what Lou said, you're seeing a lot of changes in law enforcement hiring practices right now. And, and we'll talk about that as we kind of go along. But back in 2006, we had 180 qualified uh, applicants that tested for us in 2006. In 2022, we had 36. Wow. So so we've seen, you know, from from when when Lou and, and Chief Bird and, and Chief Jogman and I all got hired. You know, you showing up to these testings uh, for the police departments and there's hundreds of people there that are fighting for this job. And it was very, very competitive. And as we've kind of gone through, it's um, it's gotten a lot harder to find these qualified applicants. It's gotten harder to find people that want to do law enforcement as a career. Um, and I think some of that goes on, you know, with the national sentiment, uh, but also when the economy is really good. Uh, there's there's a lot of money to be made in other in other uh, uh, avenues. Uh, you know, I mean, a nice, a great local government job with great insurance, great benefits. I think we've gotten a really good uh, we're a really good place where where pay is is up throughout the state for our officers. Uh, but we're constantly trying to find new and innovative ways to bring people in. Uh, like Chief Bird said, 30 miles. We raised ours uh, to 30 miles as well. We can have people live in Missouri. We're on we're 15 miles from St. Louis. So if somebody wants to live in Missouri, they're more than welcome to live in Missouri. I don't look at it as that they're not invested in our city and they're not invested in our community just because they live somewhere else. Um, you can still find those people that have that in, in, that investment in your community while they're working. Uh, just because they go home to another community doesn't mean that they don't care about our community and and that they're not going to be great police officers and great service for us. So we're always looking for ways to try to streamline that process and get more people involved in that. Because it is, it's a long process. And, and when when Lou, when Chief Jogman talks about this, you know, from this from the process of the testing, this can be upwards to a year. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, when when you are looking at testing for a department, because departments test at different times throughout the year. Um, some of the bigger departments like Springfield uh, may test every month. Some of the smaller departments may test once a year. Some of them used to test only once every two years. So if you wanted to work for a Highland Park and they only test once a year, then you've got to wait until that testing comes around. And then you've got to get on that list. You've got to take the test. You've got to do the interviews. You're on that list. And depending on where you sit on that list, you may or may not get called for a background or to continue with that process. And sometimes those things can take upwards of a year, 18 months. So, you know, from a law enforcement perspective, we're, we're always looking at ways to try to streamline that process. Because you, you, Dave, if you go to, if you want a new job, Dave Hochberg, you, you show up at somebody's office, you give them your resume and, you know, they might hire you the next week. You know, it's not that easy with law enforcement. There's just a lot more of a process involved in it. And by design. design. Yeah. yeah. And by design. By design. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and by so, design. So, oh, go ahead, Dave. No, no, I, I was just going to build upon what Chief Brugman just said and, you know, walk us through that, uh, you know, the, the testing and time frame by design. What what does that look like? Yeah, so certainly. So, I mean, we're talking about a position where you're entrusted with a lot of responsibility or you're, you're entrusted to take somebody's freedom away if, if need be uh, and perhaps take a life. So, I mean, these are positions that uh, our candidates have to be carefully vetted out to the best of our ability to make sure that they're right temperament and caliber. So we don't have the types of incidents that we see and have unfortunately seen from time to time throughout the, our country. We want to avoid that at all costs. You know, we need to have the trust and, and relationship with our communities. So we do try to make it somewhat difficult to hire and to get the right people and to really kind of screen out people that would not be good fits for this. Even though they might think they are, there are things in place to kind of, you know, for us to see that, yeah, they probably aren't. And to Chief Bergman's point, we used to have a better kind of uh, ability to have a larger candidate pool to, to parse from when I took the, my, for one of my first tests, there were 3,000 people there for, you know, a handful of jobs. Um, we don't have that luxury. So now we're balancing, uh, you know, some, some of the things that we've got to do, but we still don't want to lower the standards. But we, 
So the process, to, again, we talked a little bit about the process. So a new person looking to get involved in this business, they should start looking online, see which departments are testing, see which ones they qualify for and they're eligible for, and follow their process, ap apply, make the application. One of those parts of the process probably will be uh, this power test, this po police officer wellness uh, evaluation report. There are four standards that the state of Illinois measures for your physicality or physical fitness, just essentially to make sure you, you're able to walk through the door and build upon that in the academy. So there is a sit and reach component where you have a, a different um, matrix depending on your age and your gender, where you have to score, you know, so you have to be able to reach, touch your toes or maybe an inch pass or even further depending on, you know, to demonstrate flexibility. There's a, a one minute sit up test that you've got to partake and pass. And just an example for young men in 20, 29 year old bracket, you've got to do 37 in a minute uh, for young women in that same bracket, 33. Uh, you've got a bench press test, which you know you have to bench press a certain amount of your weight one time. So one repetition of a bench press. And again, just to give some, uh, some context, for uh, young men in the 20 to 29 age group, you've got to do 98% of your weight one time, which basically is your weight. So if you weigh 200 pounds, you've got to do like 190, what is it, 198, 196, somewhere around there. Yep, 196, you're the math guy, Dave. Come on, yep. I was, waiting, I, I was waiting for you to fall down and I could correct you, 196. Yeah, so 196, um, and for uh, young women in the same category, you could do 88% of your body weight. So one time, and then there's a mile and a half run. And that mile and a half run, um, again, wants to test your aerobic capacity, your ability to go through a police academy, chase people. Um, and so for uh, young men in the age of 20 to 29, you need to do that run in 13 minutes and 46 seconds. Uh, our female candidates get 14 minutes. So there's a little bit of difference between the, 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 um, the components for, diff again, different ages as you get older. Some of those are reduced. Um, so you can find that information online. But essentially, you want to start preparing for that beforehand, because we, we can all tell you stories, unfortunately, of people who really didn't prepare and didn't know that this is what they had to do. And then came and, you know, that uh, that weight, that bar crushed, crushed their chest because they just weren't ready to do it. Or they get so gassed on that mile and a half or even the sit ups. You see people you're pulling for them and they're, you know, they're gassing out at 28, 29. Um, and so. If, if I was a young man or woman looking to get in the business, physicality is an important part of this job. And you want to start by looking up those standards and making sure you could pass those standards because each department you uh, apply for is going to want to know that you can. And there are different ways. Sometimes we used to, each uh, testing process, we'd give our own power test at each of our departments. So you'd be going weekend to weekend to weekend doing this to just pass. Um, to get to the next component, which is generally a written exam, uh, but you'd be in pretty good shape because you'd be doing all these towns and really, you know, hitting them every weekend. Now there's uh, to kind of, again, we're looking for ways to be a little more creative to get people through the door. There are locations throughout the state that you can go and take the test once. And I think it's good for a year and you get a card. It's called a power card. I know some community colleges up here on our uh, north, you know, in the northern part of the state do it. Then you've got that card. So when you go and make application to the police department, you just show them I'm valid. I've got a card. I passed it. And then you're on to the next process. And, um, you know, the next process, like I said, is generally a written exam. And I can certainly let my colleagues talk to anything about that or the power test. Yeah, well, let's go down to uh, you know, Chief Bird. They pass the power test. Sure. Okay. They go to their their facility, get their card. They're ready to go. What's next in the Calv? And then we'll ask so, Chief Bruggeman what's next down O'Fallon. So yeah, so they, you know, we know they can uh, they're physically ready. And and like Chief uh Jogman said, you know, they have you really have to prepare. You you have to get to a point where as soon as you decide you want to be a police officer, you need to change your whole attitude. Your posture needs to change. You need to start getting physically fit if you haven't been doing it. It, like you said, Lou, like Lou said, you got to be prepared. You cannot walk in there and think you're going to get through the academy just, oh, I'll just get off the couch. I'm going to get in there. I know I can do this. You have to start changing your whole posture, your whole attitude, physically, mentally. You have to prepare yourself for this. It's, not, it's just not something you can walk into. So, um, so yeah, you, you've done this. You, you're physically capable of doing the job. So you take the written test. 
in DeKalb, you have an interview process. We So the uh, police fire commission, including myself, will interview each candidate. So uh, I just recently through our last cycle, I think I interviewed 30... Five candidates, I believe, in two days. So we broke it up in two days. And we went through them. And now, you know, it's 15 or 20 minutes, Dave. Not a lot you can learn there. Um, I mean, you you know, look, I, let's just be real. I, I, people can walk in here for 20 minutes and blow smoke, right? Um, and then you, you either believe it or you don't. You, you know, it's just a small sample size of who they are, right? So they come in there. And, and this is my own pet peeve. And I'm going to put it out there for it. Everyone who's listening, who's even thinking about being a police officer, you come in there prepared to win the day. You should look the part. That means you should come in there in a suit and tie. If you're a, a male and if you're a female, you should come in appropriate attire, it, you know, when you're doing an interview. I'm, I've seen so many people come in with jeans on. I'm like, what are you doing? I was like, that is my own personal pet peeve. I'm just throwing it out there. If you come to the cow and you want to interview for a job, you better be in a suit and tie. I'm telling you, because or or and if you're a, a young lady, be in a proper attire for a business interview because this is a career job. I think people don't. Sometimes I wonder. I'm like, this is a career job. This is a career, so you should come prepared for that. My own little pet peeve. That's my own PSA. I'm telling you. So beyond that, you know, we go through the interview process. We develop a list and it's scored from, you know, by how we felt like they did on uh, in the uh an in oral interview uh in combination with their written test. So we have all this. Now they also get points here in the Cal for military. We call them military points. So they can gain military points, kind of helps them boost them up the list, Dave, if you can imagine that. So a guy could be eight initially on the list. And then you add his military points and he can move up to six, five, it depends, you know. So uh, so then we just go through the list. We start going through, we send, uh, we might send the first two or three through background. So I give it to our detectives here at the DeKalb Police Department, handle our background investigation. So I have a commander, I say, commander here, three, get started on these guys and let's see where we go. Now, we also have the poly, the, the polygraphs running at the same time. So some people immediately get disqualified, Dave. I mean, they go through the polygraph, they fail, they off the list. You know what I mean? You scratch them. So, so I mean, so you could have a list of 35, Dave, and within a week, I mean, you could be down to 18. I mean, it just depends. So, so we started that whole process. That, you know, polygraph, you pass. We do a deep dive into your background. So we don't want to, it, it makes no sense for us to do a deep dive before we know if you can even pass the polygraph. So they, so the polygraph is scheduled. They pass it. Yay. We go to the deep dive into your background. They find inconsistencies. One thing they know for me, if there's a lack of integrity, I'm scratching you. So we find anytime that there's a way you lack integrity, you are off the board here in the city of DeKalb. We take you off. We don't We don't even go any further. We eliminate them as a possibility to be a police officer in DeKalb. If you can make it past that, great. You get through the, the commander comes back to me, chief. He has four backgrounds. These are all good candidates, sir. All right, thank you. I approve these. They go to a psyche eval. They pass the psyche eval. Yay. They go into uh, medical. They pass the medical. Yay. They really, they, you know, they're almost there. And then they usually get, at that point, they'll get a conditional offer, Dave, after they pass that. And then uh, they'll get sworn in as police officers, and then they'll go to the academy. So that's just uh, how we do it in DeKalb. All right. What about you, Don O'Fallon, Chief Brooklyn? Yeah, very similar. But I think what's important to note is that this this background. So you know, when we take this test, when they do the interviews and, and then they get put on this list and then you go into this background, just how thorough this background needs to be for our for our profession. Um, this isn't a background where you're just making a few phone calls. Um, this is a comprehensive criminal and character background um, with with a kind of a deep dive 
um, into all of the things where we're not just calling people. We're actually showing up at people's houses. We're doing personal interviews with family members. We're doing personal interviews with the prospective officer in conjunction with a polygraph. We're, we're talking to neighbors. We're walking over to neighbors' houses and we're asking questions about how they live and what they're like and how they as neighbors. We're going back to former employers. It is a lot more in depth, I think, than any other any other profession out there because it needs to be because you all you know that when you when you apply for a job you're going to put down two or three professional references and they're going to they're going to say David Hawkberg he's amazing he's such a great guy well so, I don't know about I don't, I don't know the, uh, yeah. if you well, if they met him I'm not so sure about that but so, I, I, well that's why I put down 12 to get to two that's so right that's why. yeah, yeah. <laughs> So one of the big things you're doing is you're doing a deep dive into those references and those personal contacts. And then when you're talking to that reference, well, give me the name of two or three other people. Uh, and then you go to them and then you go, give me a name of a couple other people that you know. Because realistically, my job as a background investigator is to find something to eliminate you. Uh, and, and I don't know if anybody else takes that thing, but my job is to try to find something in your background that will, so that way... You're, you're, you're beyond reproach. So that way, you know, we know that you are a good fit for organization and you have the highest integrity. My little PSA right here, just like a cheap bird is, if I find out you lied on your background or in anything like that, you're done. So if you're listening to this and you have, and you want to be a police officer and you got something a little sketchy in your background, disclose it. Okay. We're all human. We know it. We know that people make mistakes. We know that people are not are not infallible. Uh, so you know what? Disclose it because if I find out you lied about it, I'm kicking you out of the process, 100%. And it's likely that you may not find a job because realistically, too, we all talk in law enforcement. And when you're applying for us, and you're applying for another department, you're applying for another department, you're required to usually on these backgrounds to list all of the departments you applied for. So then when we go around and look and we say, hey, this guy applied for you. Did you do any of our type of a background? Let me take a look at his application over there because they signed waivers on all this stuff so we can get that. And if I find out they lied, they're done. So that's the big thing. So, so you know, before I get into after they get the job, Lou, and I'll throw it over to you to, you know, to walk us through the academy and 16 weeks and then getting into a car and, and going through field officer training, what type of things could, you know, since you guys brought it up, to, to be honest, what type of things did people not tell you that were not that big of a deal, right? Like I, I cheated on my, I used to borrow the quiz from Senorita Manias in high school and get really good grades on my, on my, uh, on my high school exam. Is that something I got when I was up at DeKalb, I used a, uh, fake ID and got carded and got busted for using a fake ID and you know the, all of that stuff I got arrested in high school because I had a I had a Jerry Maguire type of party you know um, uh, um, you know that uh, you know party and got arrested because I called the cops because people weren't leaving I mean I mean those are three things in my background are those are those are those like so whatever and you were young and dumb to to just say hey you know these are three because because back when i was if i was 25 that was within 10 years right and if i'm applying to job to be a police officer i got arrested in high school i got arrested man i was a pretty bad kid i got busted for cheating in high school i got arrested in high school for for having a party and i got arrested in college for 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 using a fake id are those the type of things that you should disclose because it's really not that big of a deal just being young and dumb and I'll, I'll start with Kirk and, and go backwards. Oh, I agree. Yeah. That's, I mean, those are some of the things we come into uh, some of the things with just minor drug use. Okay. Oh, okay. Because you did a little bit. Of, I mean, it's, you know, at one point uh, it was, man, if we found out you did any drugs at all, you were done. Okay. Times are changing, uh, right. you know, and there, there are times where people have done things when they were in high school or college. Now, if you did some hard drugs last week, okay, we've got some issues. Uh, but if something happened when you were in college and you know you've learned from it, and I know there are some departments that have a strict 100%. If you've ever done anything more than marijuana, we're not going to consider hiring you. 
Okay. But I know there's a lot of departments that understand that sometimes kids, uh, you know, experiment with things and it's wrong and it's not right, but it doesn't necessarily make them a bad person. And it doesn't have a huge effect on how they are growing and their integrity moving forward. So um, I think that uh, minor arrests, different things like that. I've had people lie about um, whether or not they've been kicked out of another process uh, because they were embarrassed about being kicked out of a process. Um, so he lied about even applying for the department. So if you're willing to lie about that, something that just happened within the last year, then what else are you willing to lie about? It's an integrity issue. Chief Bird. Yeah, for me too, Dave, I'm, I'm with uh, Chief Boogerman on that uh, for the most part. Like I said, it, you know, this goes back to me when it comes to drug use is preparing to be a police officer. If you know you're going to be a police officer, when you shut that down, I mean, truly, like, you know, at least a year out, if not more. I mean, I mean, like you, you've decided you want to be a police officer. You know that when you become a police officer, you will not be able to use cannabis. So why aren't you know, you might as well shut that down if your intentions are to be a police officer, because for me, it would be nothing worse for me to say to see an application. And it says when the last time you used cannabis Oh, last week, what do <laughs> like, wait a minute now. I mean, seriously. You knew you were going to be a police officer. You put your name in this hat. You put your, you know, you're jumping in this bucket where you know you're not going to be able to do this any longer. So why wouldn't you, you know, if it was me, I'm just, this is just me speaking, you know, humbly here. You know, if I knew I wanted to be a police officer and I was doing cannabis or whatever the case may be, I, I'm telling you, a year or more out, I would have said, hey, you know what, I'm done with this. I want to prepare myself to go into law enforcement. And I don't want this to hinder me in any way from being a cop. So that's what I would do. I'm just speaking for the people who are listening for us. So you young men and women, there's something to think about. Not, I'm just giving you a, some advice on that. But yeah, there are some things that are very minor to me uh, that we would, like I said, would uh, probably wouldn't be a deal breaker for us, Dave. Um, like, you know, some of the things that Chief spoke about, but uh, I, I tell you one thing that I do look at really seriously, you know, and, and you know, any type of uh, domestic battery uh, history or some kind of verbal abuse history like that. I look at those things. Those are important to me. Uh, and, uh, and and I'm going to really do a deep dive into that. And I and I'm lucky because I have a a, uh, a large enough detective division where they can really jump and get deep into this. And I expect nothing but that from them. And then I have one-on-ones with the detectives who actually do the backgrounds because I want to see how did you feel about them, truly? Give me your gut reaction about this person. You know, and they might give they, they might say, you know, sometimes they'll give you, a, you know, a background back, Dave, and it'll be like, and you can tell it's like, hey, he's all right. Like, I don't want all right, though. See, that's what I'm saying. I don't want all right. I want someone who is going to be an amazing police officer in this department. Now, I'm not looking for cookie cutter. I don't need every guy to walk through this door at 6'4", 250. I don't need that. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a quality person who has all the attributes that we're looking for. And stature has nothing to do with it. I know some, I, I had to have this conversation with some of our our members on our police fire commission, because they look at people who walk in the door and they say, oh man, I can't, I can't really see him as a police officer. Well, what does that mean? You know, like, I mean, they come in all different sizes and shapes. So, so when I talk to my detectives, a lot of times I want to know, I know he passed the background and he has some minor issues, but what do you really think about the person? Is this someone you would want to work with? Is this somebody who you can see you know, going into a, a firefight with and somebody you can see, you know, working with you on a daily basis, you think they would support you, would they be there for you in a time of need? Those are the things I want to hear from them. And if, if they can give me that, then I'll, I'll move them on through the process. But uh, so it's, it's a lot to it, Dave. It really is. And that's why this process takes almost a year or more because we are doing a deep dive and we're talking to our investigators. We're asking them, what's your gut feeling about this person? Because when you put this uniform on, Dave, I mean, the responsibility is extreme. 
And we all know, like Lou spoke about earlier, hey, look, you can legally take someone's life. I mean, there's, they're not, there's no profession like this, you know, where you can legally do this, where you might have to, at some point in your career, use deadly force and legally do it. So we want the right people to be in those positions because it's a huge responsibility. And I'm not going to just offer it to anyone. I'm just not. I need someone who's going to be, who's going to have their moral compass pointing in the right direction, Dave. If they don't have that, believe me, I'm not taking them. Hey, where are these six four two fifty guys? Because I don't, I don't have any of those. Uh, hey, I got, I got four big enough to fit them. So I got, I got, a, I got an offensive tackle from Southern Illinois right now. Stairs. <laughs> Uh, before I get to Lou, I just want to let you know it was either 1986 or 87. I got arrested at the Jungle Bottle Store that's no longer around. If you want to have records pull that, uh, feel free. I'd like to see what I look like with one chin back in 1986. Lou, what um, what what, uh, what are some red flags um, uh, up in Highland Park? We, you know, you know, we heard Chief Brogman, Chief Bird. Uh, you know, lying, uh, domestic, you know, what, what, what are you guys red flagging up in HP? Same thing. I mean, everything that uh, my colleagues just talked about um, would be concerns for us too. So again, I know we're getting up against it. So we want to get to the next part of it, um, uh, what the next step is, but you know, lying is the big one, you know, your credibility is everything in law enforcement. You are going to court and testifying. And um, you know, it's essentially when sometimes you see a crime now, body cameras, it is a little bit different, but you know, what you see, you're testifying to, you better have the utmost integrity because that's all you have in this business. And this whole process is designed, as we've talked about, to find the right people to make sure they're going to do uh, honorable policing and fair policing. And so we've put, a lot, there are a lot of hurdles to getting this position, which we've talked about. Now, they'll be different at each you know, municipality, same, but maybe different sequences. But expect to go through the power test if you're looking to get this job, a written exam for each municipality, generally speaking. Um, you'll be on a list at some point if you pass all the components. Those components might include an interview with maybe police staff and then the police commission. And so you get on this list with the ultimate goal of getting a call one day to be sent to the academy. Um, for us, we do a little different. We then do the deeper, we do a preliminary background on our candidates, but then when you're offered the job, we do a deeper dive. Um, and, and so for us, listen, you know, we spare no expense. We, we send our, our investigators to Texas. They will drive down or fly down to Texas. If you, if you're coming from Texas and talk to your bosses, your, your coworkers, I mean, we are not, you know, just picking up the phone and taking chances. We're driving down all across the country for our candidates and yeah, some of the things that we've seen in the past, people misrepresented the reason they left their, their employment, i.e. they got fired, didn't want to share that. We find that out and not a good look. So just again, to that point, be candid. But ultimately, all of this leads to then a job offer. And then again, for our process, we then do at that point when there's a job offer, a comprehensive psychological examination. There are a number of companies throughout the state where you'll sit with a licensed psychologist and go through a battery of exams to see if you, you know, meet the standards that the state is looking for or a municipality, the deep dive background, a medical examination, you know, you're going through a physical examination to make sure that all your parts are working and you can do the job because it is a physical job from time to time. Um, and then at the end of the day, when you're offered that job, yeah, you're sworn in as a police officer and then it's off to the academy. And so the real work begins at that point. Um, to be a police officer in the state of Illinois, you ultimately have to pass a state certification test. So it's a written test. Uh, I wouldn't say it's like the bar because it's not as challenging as the bar. I mean, there's quite a bit to, you know, depending on who you are, it can be challenging, but there is case law. There's, you know, all of the different things that you need to know to be a police officer, tactics, uh, community policing um, elements, so it is kind of a comprehensive exam that you have to pass to be state certified in the state of Illinois. And the academy is the mechanism that gets you there. So the, the academy is like law school I mean, for, for cops. It's where you go to learn uh, relevant case law, defensive tactics, um, and, and how to be a good police officer, community policing, just all of the different elements that go into this bucket of being a police officer, how to de-escalate, how to work with people, how to help people. So the academy, you, you have to successfully complete the academy. You learn how to use your firearm in the academy. Again, defensive tactics. The academy is 16-week program right now, 640 hours. 
And again, there are a number of them throughout the state. Different municipalities will send their officers to with the same ultimate goal of getting them to the pass that state test. Um, but it is, a, you know, a 640 hour program that ultimately hopefully leads to you graduating and being a certified police officer in the state of Illinois. Um, and once you're certified, you, you can go become, you know, do the work and go back to your agency. And then you start learning the work there. And we can talk about that in a second. All right, well, let's go. Uh, I'm sorry, Chief Bogman. It's important to note real quick that the academy is, um, not anybody can just walk up and say, I'd like to go to the academy. Um, so with the exception of a few academies that offer some spots for what they call interns, I know the academy down in Southern Illinois at Southern Southwestern Illinois College, all the academies are, are, are ran uh, or basically overseen by the Illinois Law Enforcement Training and Standards Board. So nobody can just open up an academy. Um, so they all have a, a standard curriculum. And then nobody can just walk in the door and say, I want to go to the academy. Um, generally, you have to be sponsored or hired by a police department to go to the academy. So um, it's, it's an interesting thing where everybody else, um, you know, does all their training and then gets hired. We'll actually hire you and then send you to training and pay you while you're going to training. So it's, a, it's actually a pretty good deal. It is. Yeah, they got a nice, uh, there's a nice uh, facility up here at College of DuPage that uh, I've spoken at. Uh, Chief Retired Chief Newton from Lombard invited me in to just talk to the uh, cadets about credit and all that stuff. So uh, a, a fascinating. I had no idea. The, I must have driven by that college 4,000 times and had no idea the extensive um, network that they had there to train law enforcement. It's pretty impressive. All right, so so let's talk about field training, guys, and then we'll wrap this up. Uh, let's start down south in O'Fallon. You 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 do the uh, strength training. You get the card. You do the background checks. You guys do colonoscopies on these candidates. You give them the green light. You um you 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 send them to the academy. They get their six hundred plus hours or sixteen weeks. Then they come back. Okay, so the candidate has graduated from the academy, passed the test. So you've got a guy or a gal, Chief Bruggeman, sitting down there in O'Fallon. What happens? And then we'll ask uh, Chief Bird what happens and Chief Jogman as well. And then we'll wrap it up. So what happens down in O'Fallon when you get somebody a graduate of the academy? Yeah, generally, and I think throughout all of policing, it's this is now where you learn how to be a police officer. Uh, you've gone to the academy and you've learned the basics, uh, but you've not done anything in real life. You've not dealt with real people. You've done everything, um, you know, just scenarios. So um, we always say that this is where you actually learn how to be a police officer in our town and police the way that we need you to police our community. So uh, the way ours works out is it's, a, it's 14 weeks. Um, it's two week. Uh, ours is well, it's actually it's closer to 16 weeks because we do two weeks of uh, just kind of an orientation where we get people ready. It's important to know that we'll swear somebody in. And they'll go to the, sometimes they'll go to the academy and we won't see them for 16 weeks. I mean, other than, you know, visiting them in the academy every once in a while, but they live at the academy and then they go home on the weekends. So when they're coming to us after the academy, we haven't seen them for four months for the most part, um, you know, other than some of our instructors. So we'll do some, some brief orientation, regular city stuff, but then they'll start a three, three-step process. Well, each one lasts about a month where they work with a different field training officer for each one of those months and then gradually work up, you know, where they're, where they're not even driving the first couple of weeks. And then they learn how to drive. I guess they know how to drive, but they learn how to drive a police car and they're operating at maybe 25% of the, of the workload. And then to step two, where they're operating at 50 to 75%. And then at step three, where they're handling 75 with the goal being at the end of those, at the end of those 12 weeks to be handling 100% of that workload with that field training officer. And then for another two weeks, we call it a shadow period where that police officer actually just is either in plain clothes, the field training officer, or, the, um, or they're following them in another car and going on their calls um, and just making sure. And that's really where the rubber meets the road for us. Um, the majority of people will pass the academy. The academy is somewhat difficult, but it's not really where uh, we don't really 
I don't want to say fail people out of the academy. Most people will pass the academy, but where the rubber meets the road is when you get to be on field training and you get to interact with our community, interact with people. Uh, and that's where we find uh, whether or not you're going to be a good fit for our organization. So it's kind of hard. We've already invested all of this time into you trying to get you hired and then four months while you're at the academy. And then we're going to do everything we can to push you through and make you successful in those next four to six, four months. And sometimes it doesn't work out. Uh, and sometimes we have to part ways. And that's always a tough, tough decision because at that point, we may have eight months, nine months where we've been paying you as a police officer and you've done absolutely no work for us, you know, uh, other than driving around with somebody. Um, so that's a, it's a difficult decision, but a very important decision to have. So chief Bird, take it from there, bud. Yeah. So it's like chief said, I mean, you you know, we, we spend all this money for you, hoping everything works out for us. Um, and, uh, you know, I can, you know, it, and, it, you know, like you said, the Academy, I know Lou, we all know, like when we started, I mean, I went to the Academy in the eighties and it was different. I had a guy who I went to, I got to use the bathroom at maybe 2 a.m. or something. And uh, there was a guy packing up his stuff and he left in the middle of the night. He's like, this ain't for me. He walked out, you know, and I was like, man, I was like, where are you going? He's like, this ain't for me. He's like, I'm not doing this. And he walked, packed his stuff up 2 a.m. He walked out of State Police Academy. There's a There was a trooper who was at the desk. He didn't say a word to him, kept his head down. He's like, I can care less if he leaves. He's like, we don't stop anybody from walking out that door. If they want to walk, they go. You know, he's like, so and it was just, and I was like, wow, okay. So, so, and those days have changed. I mean, like, of course, it, it's, uh, you know, like, you know, it's it's not an easy program, but, you know, you, the odds you get somebody walking out in the middle of the night, those probably doesn't happen anymore. So, uh, but, you know, one of the things we do is similar to the same thing. We, you know, they, they graduate, they get back here. I, you know, we try to run, you know, we basically try to run them through different officers through the FTO program, field training officers, field training program. Uh, we try to run them through different officers because sometimes, let's just be real. I mean, you could have a personality conflict. You know, sometimes guys just don't jive and I get it. So, uh, so we try to, you know, we give them three weeks with, let's say, with you, Dave, you got them for three weeks. I'll take them for the next weeks. Kirk takes them for three weeks, and then Lou takes them. I mean, we just kind of rotate them. So everyone can kind of get an idea of who this person is. And if there is a personality conflict, we're not weighing, you know, his whole career on one personality conflict. We got other officers who can say, yeah, they just don't get along. I get it. But they're doing the job. It's okay. So so uh, when we get here, you know, there's so, you know, and I think Kirk spoke about this too, is that there are nuances for every department. You know, it's not like, well, and I don't know when I first came back out, they like, hey man, we don't, I, you just went to the academy. When I was a young trooper, they was like, yeah, we don't do that in Chicago. I was like, okay, all right. So I had to be taught the Chicago way, how to, you know, how to work for the Illinois State Police in Chicago. It was different than what the troopers were doing in Southern Illinois. So it's the same thing here in DeKalb. There's just certain nuances that are just a little different. So, but they have the basic, they have the basic foundation. That's all we need them to have. And then we mold them when they become, when they get to the field training program. Now, sometimes they doesn't happen often. Some people can expedite the process. So you can have an early, let's say you have an early release on the FTO program. Now you gotta be on point all the time. And then you, you might be able to release that person early. It doesn't happen often. But there are times when someone is so polished that you can release them early. And that means they can make the impact because truly you don't get the impact date until that officer is on solo patrol and alone and can do jobs and can take jobs by himself. That's when you really feel the impact in, at the police department. Uh, so, you know, it, you know, you would like to get them out early, but like I said, it doesn't happen often because you don't want to risk someone going out too early and not being prepared for everything that's going to be in front of him as a police officer, you know, so many landmines out there that they have to learn to navigate. So, uh, but let's say they get through the process. We, you know, we say, Hey, you know, the MTO say chief, he's ready for solo patrol. 
great. He made it through the FTO training program. We put him on solo patrol and we evaluate him for the rest of his year. So, you know, and then they get released after a year, they get their year in probation. It's like, you know, they, they get anointed. Hey, you're good to go. And then they're, uh, and then they're, act, you know, at that point, they're like every other rank and file police officer here at the police department. But until they get that year on, they're still being evaluated on a regular basis. So although they might not have an FTO in their car, we're still doing biweekly checks on them. And, and uh, sergeants are, are constantly reviewing their reports even more than they would someone who's been on the job, let's say, two or three, four or five years. So they, they, they're they getting that, uh, they're getting it once over, they're getting it twice over. So, uh, so that's kind of how we handle it here. Before Lou, Lou talks, talks, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kirk. Before Lou talks, I have a real quick story um, about how you're really not ready to be a police officer when you come out of the academy. And I'll just say, I've got a picture up on my back wall here. The very first guy arrested on uh, FTO, uh, his booking photo when we took Polaroids. Uh, and, uh, and I remember fingerprinting him and being so nervous. And he looked at me and he says, hey, you're doing a good job. Keep it up. Let me show you how this is done. He'd been fingerprinted so many times that he helped me with his own fingerprinting. So, you know, I, at that time, it was 10 week, 12 weeks in the academy. But, you know, these guys, these new officers, they're not used to this. They're not dealing with people on a regular basis. So sometimes they need a little bit of help. Hey, That's Chief, what that FTO hey, process hey, is for. Hey, Chief, I know you and Chief, and Chief Jogman can relate to this. Dave, they always know the rookies. When I say... They 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 like oh he's new he like it's nothing worse than somebody pointing to you saying there's the new guy you know and uh, I mean I I would make a traffic stop and they would be oh you must be new <laughs> like well yeah I am uh, I mean it, it's just funny it's, it, it's so true though like Chief said that they can point you out in a the heartbeat they know the new guys <laughs> all right Chief Jogman wrap it up buddy all right as we take it home two points of clarification so uh, number one. Um, we do not do colonoscopies. So, you know, I'm not trying to scare anybody away. So, you know, we do not do that as part of the medical exam. <laughs> and number two, uh, I know Chief Bergman mentioned staying over at the academy as the chief bird. There are some academies where it, it is like the military and it's boot camp and you sleep there and eat there and then right. leave maybe for the weekends. But there are other academies as well that are a little more conducive to family life that like suburban law enforcement academy, it's like school. You go there Monday through Friday, but you leave at the end of the day and go home. So don't let that scare you off. If you've heard either of that, there's a fit for everybody. Yeah, CPD um, goes home every night. So right, CPD does too. So there's there's academies, you know, depending on where your department sends you. So that's something to consider too when you're applying. Um, so at the end of the day, all of this conversation, you know, hopefully helpful for people out there that are looking to to get a job in law enforcement. I hope also, I think we all hope that you know our residents hear that it is a comprehensive. What we do is thorough. It's not fail proof, you know, unfortunately we do see officers that get through um, and then we have to deal with them differently you know, on, on the department, either through discipline or termination if they're not meant to be. Um, but the whole intent of this is to find the right people uh, to do the job honorably, serve nobly, uh, represent their community in you know, the utmost way. Um, one of the things we do, we do all the same things with our officers that come out, you know, after um, the academy, we do, we have a mentor program. So we assign one particular officer uh, to kind of liaise with that candidate throughout the field or throughout the academy and field training. So they have one good, you know, contact that they can call if they're struggling questions. Um, and we've seen that really be helpful. But, you know, one takeaway is just for people to realize in this crisis that we've got right now with hiring, you know, when you're nine officers down, 10 officers down or more, look at this process and look at why we're concerned as law enforcement executives about where we might be heading. If I have an officer retire today and leave and say, you know, I've done my 20, I'm done. I will not have that replacement for nine months, 10 months, as long as everything goes right with the academy, field training, background, the hiring process. I will not have somebody back in that squad car for 10 months, that means that's one less person out on the street. And if that happens with three people, five people, you can imagine what an impact on public safety and on each individual department that can be. It's not like we can just hire somebody and say, here's your two week training, go, ahead, go, go, go forth and do good things. There's too much at stake for that. And so that is our challenge right now in law enforcement, something that we've not seen 
you know, and that's why we're extremely concerned with the lower numbers and people not wanting to do the job because of maybe the rhetoric or all the different things that are happening out there and leaving earlier and not doing 25 years, leaving right at 20 or leaving earlier. So a great conversation, gentlemen. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, brought back some memories, um, brought back some uh, some PTSD on my end from my academy. I went to Chicago Police Academy and I can remember some um, some defensive tactics, things that really made it uh, real to me. I had one of my instructors, uh, Jim Marsh, walked up to me, uh, pulled me out of the group and had me stand in front of everybody. He did something with his finger. He flicked the back of my neck and I didn't know who I was for like 10 minutes after that, just to show that it doesn't have to be this overt force. Um, but it was an amazing experience because I really didn't know who I was for like 10 minutes. Uh, but you get called out and, uh, you know, you just push through it. It teaches you how to be resilient. And I remember those moments from 1993 still to this day. So great conversation, everybody. So in closing, if, 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 uh, if a listener or a viewer wants to learn more about becoming a, um, a, a police officer, would, would you recommend them to go to O'Fallon Police, the Cal Police Department website, the Highland Park Police Department website, uh, ISP, Illinois State Police, or the uh, ILACP. Uh, is that where you recommend, you know, a quick any, reference point after listening to this? Any, all, any and all of those, Dave. Any and all of those. I mean, truly. I mean, you can go individually. Yeah, Illinois Associated Chiefs Police is a great place to go as well. Uh, I think we have Blue Line, which uh, is, is, you know, they. I mean, any of the glass doors, any of those places, if you put in uh, law enforcement, they'll I mean, you get so much information. But okay. I mean, we have a recruitment video here at DeKalb. I would love, you know, it's on our Facebook page. It's on our web page. You know, they can easily take a look at that. Um, a lot of information out there to grab. But, I, I mean, I, I, we love our website. So we, we hope people, we expect them to come read about us. If you're planning on applying for us, you should know who we are. So okay. uh, that's what I would do. Yeah, yeah you can go to any, any department, David. Uh, and, you know, if you live in a community, just reach out to your department. And if for whatever, most departments have recruitment teams. And if you're if they, if they don't, go online, look for a website that looks friendly for the community that's near you and reach out. I'm telling you, you'll, you'll get a good response from the recruitment team. We'll, we'll do ride alongs for people. Put them in the car. Hey, come ride with us to see what it's about, to make sure it's something you want to do. Um, it's pretty easy. You just have to take that first step and reach out. I want to thank all three of you chiefs for another amazing episode of behind the badge, Illinois. If you're looking to purchase a new home or refinance your existing home, give me a call eight five 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 six david Go to 56david.com. It extends not only to you and your staff, but also your family. Download other podcasts. Thanks for listening. Be safe. Thanks chiefs. We'll talk to you next week. All right. See everybody.